Hi everybody, this is Suze and Julia from Be Astute. Um, <laughs> Suze, I'm not sure it counts as exciting news, but the Education and Skills Funding Agency, who we call ESFA, is going. I think it's really exciting news. Well, slightly uh, exciting um, because we know that um, this means that we're in a different era. And very clearly, very quickly in a different era from what we've got, what's gone before. So for people who don't know me, I've been around on the funding side of things going back to the tech days, right? So I have been involved with or worked with or been funded by every iteration of the funding agencies since the um, Training Enterprise Councils, going back since God was a boy. Um, I was about to say. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I would like to point out that yes obviously I started very young when I worked for the tech obviously terribly young you were a prodigy darling practically still in primary school but the idea that now Labour has Labour has basically said we're doing things differently we are ripping it up and we we there is a real statement of intent I think behind saying the funding agency the ESFA um, and the precursors are not the way we're going to play this game anymore Okay, so I've got a couple of interesting questions for you. For it. So putting this to one side, what is your perception from being around the industry for over 30 years? <laughs> what is your perception as to what the big issues were within further education? Well, I mean, I think the first one, and I think anybody listening to this would agree that the um, the real terms funding collapse in the industry has been seismic over the years. And, and I don't think we can labor the point enough that people have been doing really good work on really shoestring budgets for a very, very long time. I mean, when is the last time FE got a real even an inflationary pay rise. The funding remains static forever. And um, I think that was the big thing when you looked at, say, from the text to the Learning the Skills Councils, where it went from localised funding systems to nationalised funding formula, where there wasn't any sense of how does that impact in local communities. So for people involved in the FE and employability sectors, so the skills and employability sectors, over the last 30 years, there has been a lot of really good institutional muscle that left because programs got cut, um, the tendering opportunities were few and far between and tended to favor large um, complex primes rather than looking at what was on the ground. So I think that's probably the biggest thing. And I think that as for going, I think means policy decided nationally in the education department, but funding is going to be very much localised um, through combined authorities and local authorities. That's where I probably disagree with you, because okay. what drive you've got two things that drive profitability for supply for providers. Yeah, one is the price per qualification. Yeah. And the other is the overall availability of funding. So what we've seen over the last 5, 10, 15 years is the price per qualification has been static or falling for yeah. everything other than the move from apprenticeship frameworks into standards, which gave that opportunity for that backdoor pay rise that the sector desperately needed. Yeah. Um, but that's the only pay rise that the sector has had is that apprenticeship change. The big thing, of course, is that the amount of money that you can contract for has also massively shrunk. We just have to look at the AEB budget. ASF, um, now. ASF now. But right. yes, it, it, it's not made the budget go up, though, has it? I mean, we've got a different three letter acronym, but the money's only gone down. Yeah, but I, I I agree. The pot of money has shrunk and shrunk and shrunk. And that is an absolute key um, element of austerity 
and the previous education understanding so this, of what good skills looks like for a growing so economy. This move to get rid of ESFA, unless it's accompanied by an increase in budget, is not going to massively change the dial in terms of funding for providers because if the pot is shrinking, the pot is shrinking, nobody is going to increase that price per qual. However, I think you already do see that where um, combined authorities have got local key areas of priority, there is additional funding available, right? So, if, for example, the GLA on ASF um, contracting, there's uh, £400 per job. It's not part of the adult education budget. Um, but they but found additional money found for additional work. Work because for them... That one sense. of the priorities for the mayor's office is to, for a thriving growing economy, you need to have that skilled workforce actually getting into work. So the skills and job elements are no longer divorced in London on the ASF fund. So um, that's where we're likely to see innovation in funding, and not in terms of, because the price per qual at the moment is centrally set. At the moment. And that would be an interesting thing to see whether or not that changes with further devolution yeah, as yeah. to whether or not that price per qual is allowed by government to flex. And also it's a choice. And but also it's also about the mindset of this of this administration in, comp in comparison to the previous administration. So this administration more consciously recognizes that good skills, good employability skills, help people into work and help people retain and stay in work. Um, and therefore, what they are willing to fund, I mean, we've seen the bonfire qualifications over the years from the last administration, right? Oh, absolutely. And they just slashed and burned. You know, it's, it's the same as their attitude to degrees. If, it's, if it wasn't law accounting or being a doctor, they didn't they didn't see any value inherent in studying because studying is good for your mind. They didn't see any value inherent in doing humanities or music or fashion or whatever that happened to be because they were all accountants and lawyers and and they that's how they thought. I think I mean, they, that's a great di argument for diversity in Parliament. Uh, it's a great truly. argument for diversity. Just, in the cabinet, yeah. Well, just if, anyway, yeah. in any organisation, it's a great argument for diversity when you're making decisions, particularly ones which affect millions of people, yeah. is, yeah, you've got a group of people from a very narrow background making yeah. decisions about things that have never affected them personally, yeah. will never affect them personally, and are never going to affect anybody that they know. Exactly. Exactly. Because they don't care about how their plumber is educated. No. no. The rest of us care about how our plumber is educated because no, we want our plumber to be competent. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, exactly. yeah, there is a level of competence that cannot be covered by just picking it up on the job. Yeah. Because, you know, anyone can plumb. Yeah. I. Yeah, I, I think that... Um, my porter would disagree every time he has to come and fix the loo. But, you know, um, but I would say, oh, sorry. <laughs> that was the fact that you a porter. <laughs> sorry, getting distracted. He's a great from... porter. Um, I'm sure he's delightful, darling. I, I, um, but I would say this fundamentally, because we could, we could talk about this for hours, but people won't listen for hours because that's not how... So I suppose my question was whether or not this getting rid of ESPA solves the key issues that are impacting the sector and you're saying potentially maybe on a wing and a prayer and a following wind if the budgets are able to go up. So if um, devolved authorities are able to cobble together money from multiple places and use that kind of financial innovation to put more money into the pot. Um, that's likely to come through adding in additional requirements onto a contract, because I remain really sceptical about why a government that has to be focused on money 
because you know the economy isn't growing therefore the pot isn't growing so there isn't this sudden generosity of spirit that's coming in our direction i don't see them suddenly saying to local authorities you can pay whatever you like for this qualification because that's fundamentally inefficient use of taxpayers money if i can be paid twice as much in Northumberland as I am in Cornwall for exactly the same qualification to exactly the same learners. That's gonna that's kind of got um postcode lottery written all over it. Yeah, but I I I think you're you you are you are looking at this purely through the mindset of a skills provider that has been used to the last 30 years of funding. And actually I'm not sure that's what's going to happen. No, I could be wrong. I could be wrong. I, I I love the fact that you want it to be different. I, I want I it. I, I absolutely. How they can flex it is by adding in these local additions. So we were talking about um, the requirement to get somebody a job and we can pay you to get a job within this traditional funding stream that didn't ever require me to get a job that's an easy way to add more money into the pot in order to get outcomes that you want. So I can see a lot of that. I just don't necessarily see that level two in customer service, just to be really bland about it, being paid at different rates around the country because that's kind of opening them up to a world. But... I could be wrong. It would be amazing. But then you kind of have that thing from a provider basis, of, particularly for national providers. Why are we working in the places that aren't giving us a pay rise? Yeah, and don't get so me you wrong. You are adding supply and demand into Don't things. get me wrong. There's, there's flaws with the ideas that I've got. Because, you know, I back in the day, back in the day, when you used to have bidding wars over achievements on apprenticeships, right, between techs, because, you know, you need to get your money in and the providers would literally go to all of their different techs and say, who's going to pay me more money for this, right? Not great. I mean, it was good oh, but it was practice. fun. I don't know what it was fun, though. And that it was enormously too. fun. I mean, those were back in the days where you had a magnificent period, 12, and... and you know, you could do glorious, glorious things, bringing and also, people forward. And also it was back in the day where you could look at a small provider and who maybe worked with 50 learners a year in apprenticeships, who worked with children with significant new, uh, children, young adults with significant neurodiverse needs and give them a whack of an OPP in comparison to your standard provider doing the same framework because they had your intense need and support needs that you were able to go actually I want to support you this is a really important function in my patch and therefore I'm going to take 5p off an OPP from these 50 people and give all of that money to you and you, you were able to do that I'm not suggesting and, that's going to happen yeah I mean I as somebody who started in those tech days um you were able as a tech to take a chance on a new provider yeah. where you're going, yeah, I'm not sure that you know what you're and doing. I really. think this is one of the most interesting parts about why it's the good. The question that is whether going. or not these devolved authorities, you know, the techs loved their providers. They invested money in supporting providers to be better. And in the move from the techs to the Learning and Skills Council, you got rid of some of that. And then the move from the LSC to ESFA, it went completely. Yeah. ESFA effectively outsourced all of that improvement work to Ofsted. Yeah. Everything has been data-driven for years. And providers have really struggled under that because it hasn't been good data-led decision-making. It's yeah. been the computer says this, that, and the other, and therefore. Um, so, yeah, it's whether or not those local authorities have the budget to be able to do improvement work with their providers. The great thing about the techs was they could take a chance on a new provider 
And again, because they were in control of the OPPs that they were paying, I remember when we started, we got a crazy low OPP. It was piddling. Um, nobody else would have made any money on that. We didn't know any better. So we went, hell yes, we'll take that. It was a dreadful deal. <laughs> But it was our way in. Yeah. And yeah, they got a bargain. They took a risk and supported us to work out what it was that we were doing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I, it's not that I didn't enjoy those days. I think part of the concern from me moving forward to increased devolution is the efficiency of the system. But this is this is this is the point that I wanted to make. So I think apprenticeships will still be, for the time being, for sure, still be national provision. It will still be, um, you know, through DAS. It will still be the same system of funding as it currently is managed by the education department. I think the interesting stuff is the non-apps skills funding. So be it the boot camps, be it the be it ASF, be it um any UK SPF that's still hanging about and whatever labels any going other to next. three letter acronym yeah, that could be applied to them. anything. And whatever Labour's gonna do next with that pot of funding, which we won't find out until next year. I think but all of that all of that kind of getting unemployed people back into work. All and of getting that. the economically inactive people who don't consider all of themselves that. to be you know, that's where there's enormous tax benefit to be had. But I think, and yeah. But it's gone over the last 15 years, hasn't yeah, it? And, and, course, and, that's what, yeah. and that's what I think is going to be coming back with the more devolved funding in the employability and skills landscape for post-19. Because actually, if you look at some of the stories that you hear when you go to conferences and you get people who are talking about they've got a very localised project in somewhere that currently has non-devolved AEB funding or ASF funding in it, and you get these providers parachuting in to try and deliver something that just competes with a local council-funded charity that has been delivering that same piece of work over a number of years because it's seen it as a local priority. And... Who better to decide, what, and I mean, I'm not saying local council because then you get silly, but who better to decide what that area needs than that local authority in that area? They've got the plans, they've got the data, they've got the stats, they know who the employers are, they know what it is they need to see for economic regeneration in their areas. So that's really exciting. With it comes complexity, complexities. Never mind about what does a qualification offer look like, because actually, does there need to be qualifications? If you meet an employer demand that's going to get somebody a really good job and retain them in work, who knows? Let's have a think. But also, it's going to increasingly be local authorities that are doing the contract tendering and awards. I think now ESFA has gone. We already see some of the devolved authorities, of course, but I, I think that we're going to see more and more of it um, being devolved. It's interesting to see with the non-devolved areas, how they're clumped together. Yeah. Because you've got to have scale in decision-making. Again, yeah. you know, back in the, back in the day, um, we had, what, 40 techs? Yeah, about that, something like that. And some of those geographies were ridiculous in that, you know, there were seven in London, which yeah. from a population perspective was a great plan but in terms of the actual reality of life in London um where you know a mile gets you an awfully long way um and that restriction of well you've got a contract with us so you can only have so many learners that are actually in that postcode great I've got a load of people over there yes yeah yeah so yeah it's That's how you can deal it. with the administrative layout compared with what life is actually like on the ground, um, particularly in, you know, hybrid delivery, yeah, yeah. where providers can very easily go to different places. Um, and I think it's also the size of the contracts that are being awarded would be the other concern, because we're increasingly seeing this, aren't we, in the clients and people that we're talking to, 
where they're getting a 20 grand contract. You know, this is a multi-million pound turnover business, getting a 20 grand contract to run something super niche in a particular area. And you, you kind of see with providers, they're trying to adapt to this new way of working. So they're bidding for everything. And there is a, a kind of hint of not being able to see the wood for the trees. Yeah. So the strategy is going, you know, people trying to deliver random quals in random places in order to keep all the plates spinning when, and that makes sense from a business development perspective. We've got to do this here because that has the, the, that's yeah. what we bid for. As opposed to, again, going back to that strategic thinking, when the bid is coming out, how much do we want to deliver that there? And what's the impact on the back end? Really easy from a business development person to go, yeah, we're going to bid for it all. And then forget about the poor buggers that have actually got to do the work. Yeah. But also Just speaking up for but, those. But yes, you speak up for them. But I would also like to say, the amount of providers that we talk to who are on the smaller end of the scale who are actively excluded from bidding. Oh, absolutely. Go perfectly on the tendering process, but the amount they can actually deliver based on national bidding means they're always going to fall, fall below minimum contract value on national contract bids, always. And, and you know, and certainly by the time... tendering is a great opportunity for them. Yeah, and certainly by the time... They've gone through and said, all right, so we wanted £60 million worth of bids. We've got 120. They've just cut everyone down by 50%, and they automatically fall below the minimum contract value because they've only bid for that realistic 250, 300 grand that they think they can do in their local area. So for those people, if it's we're great. correct in our assumption that we're going to see much more devolution, and I think we will, I would, I would be very I'd be surprised. amazed if we don't because... Yeah. Um, all the rhetoric is about being about local decision making. Yeah. Um, it's just how you solve the problem of Absolutely. where you don't have these. Um, what you know, you've got this patchwork of devolved authorities at the moment that have kind of moved to this new way of government, and then everybody else. Yeah. Um, and it's yeah, they kind of have to fix the problem of everybody else yeah but Agreed. i suppose they're kind of giving themselves a year to do that yeah so there's going to be a lot of local authority um innovation i think coming yeah um it's also how you're dealing with the budgets because a lot of local authorities have got massive black holes and so the temptation is going to be if it's not ring fence for them to take this money and use it on things that oh i don't think they'll be able to do that i think that they would be very naughty i think the interesting bit is how much the local authorities top slice that budget in terms of managing the infrastructure of which is again one of the, contracting. yeah which is the big concern from a streamlining perspective yeah. Central contracting and central performance management and central administration is the cheapest version. But also don't forget that for a very long, long time, um, before they decided they didn't like subcontracting anymore because they got burnt, you know, it got, got a few bad headlines, did the, did, did the last administration. Um, they'd all they'd made a decision that actually they wanted to have fewer providers with larger contracts who would Absolutely. then do the subbing so that the yes. smaller providers would get the subcontracts from the larger providers and that Absolutely. they would not be in the game, but the, the, the funding agency would have to... Exactly. They were outsourcing and devolving yeah. all of that quality assurance and management. They just did it really badly. Really badly. Um, really, really badly. But, you know, if you're a national or even a regional provider working across multiple areas... And you're specialising on this non-app funding. Mm -hmm. You're basically going to have to have a whole department that is constantly tendering for business. Yeah, You're going to be working with multiple MIS systems. 
and it's going to be really fragmented. So actually how you organize yourself to yes. make that efficient and make that good and to join up all the dots is probably a key bit of prep work that providers should be starting now to get ready for next year because it's already there. You already see a lot of providers spending a lot of money bidding for stuff. Yeah. And again, this is where this itty bitty provision is sticking in rather than the strategic thinking. And, and I would like to make the point that on my video last week, why for you Zoo? Because the only way is up, baby. I did I'm make sure your age. Like Gen X and proud. <laughs> um, but the, the, but I did make the point that actually now we know we're going to see this further de de devolving of funding, the localization agenda. We know this. We know the way Labour is thinking around skills and employability. We know about that, the impact of what they want to see from any investment they make in terms of local economic growth. We know all of that is going to come. Um, the first shot across the bows was we're getting rid of ESFA. That's, that's the first shot across the bows of what is going to be a very different agenda for skills and employability from this administration to the previous, who didn't really have an agenda for skills and employability at all, let's face it. Um, they had so, no agenda yeah, at all, apart yeah. from um, benefit sanctions. That was their benefit agenda. Benefit sanctions, must say level. Sanctual people and, back yeah. into work. Yeah, so, so there's going to be a very different focus and... Um, that is exciting. I think it's really exciting, actually, for some of those regional players at the moment that have been excluded from the national. Because if you look at um, the um, commissioning, say, for example, for Restart and things like that, I mean, your balance sheet had to be massive to be able to get into um, the opportunity to tender yeah, for... I'm not sure that led to great provision. Well, some, some excellent provision out there and some that needs... Oops, a reasonable That's amount of, um, a reasonable amount of refocus in terms of what, what, what the outcome should look like. But the whole point is there's regional players now that don't have that balance sheet. But if that's more if that becomes the next thing that becomes a bit more devolved or a bit more the contract package areas sort of like reflect combined authority and local authority areas like skills does. Then you've got the opportunity for people who maybe have been excluded from that direct contracting to enter that marketplace as a prime rather than a sub. So there's loads it's, of different ways of looking at so it. I think, yeah, it's, it's just in that the devil is in the detail, but there are clear things that people can be getting ready for now. One yeah. is really looking at their business structure. Yeah how they are making strategic decisions, because we're already seeing a lot of providers that don't think strategically no. from a business development perspective and aren't joining the dots between what the front end is doing in terms of bidding yeah. for contracts and really thinking about the impact On of operation. what that means operationally. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that is work that can or should be done now because if you're already in a mess with this, it's not going to get any better. And also, I think that because that, that needs to be done now, but I think there's other things that need to be done as well. So um, I would be seriously looking if I was a skills provider around what does employability look like in the in the in the in the most serious outcome um way, because the stats around that will be really important for future tendering opportunities. Um, because people aren't going to give you, I don't think this year is going to be about, um, it will not be funding skills just because you want to go and because do Because it's that. a lovely thing there to do. There will be some of that in community learning, but in terms of the mainstream stuff, you know, you really need to start thinking about how do you gather data? How do you monitor data? How do you read your data? Preparing for what's coming down the line. What does that look like? Making, making strategic choices around the kind of data that you need to capture and what data system you're using at the moment to do that which it's is going to be important. my next point is so many providers 
are not joined up. They they think they've got great data, but actually when you do any kind of scrape under the surface, it's, you wanna, there's yeah. systems, it's a lot of siloed working. So within the silo, we've got great data. But again, if we're looking strategically across the business, it's really tough to join those pots of data together. So that's only going to become worse because we know that a lot of local authorities have an opinion about what system that you are using to claim money from them. Well, they we have know that primes already have an opinion about what you're doing. So you're seeing, you're seeing increasingly and the direction of travel increasingly is going to be providers on the surface having less agency about the systems that they're using. All that means is actually you've got the same amount of agency. You just need to be looking at it as to how you're pulling it all together and how you're creating your yeah. own information system. The big systems that are on the market are probably not fit for that purpose. Well, um, no, yeah, I, and I think that... In terms of going across contracts, yeah. across devolved areas, talking to all the different systems and combining the MIS and finance data with operational data. Yeah. That's yeah, yeah. what you need. And most providers don't have that at the level that they need to be able to intervene quickly and efficiently. Yeah, and I do think that if we're right, and, you know, I'm never wrong, so, you know, we are right. Um, I'm a Duncan. We're allowed to say that. Duncans are never wrong, according to my father. Um, so, but uh, what I would say to that is that we know that the Vold Authority um, two-year contracting that happened last year, that you might get another year out of it. Don't know if you will, because at the end of the day, um, new labour... Oh, well, not new labour. Labour is new, um, and they will have their opinions about what they want to be. Um, all the funding priorities will change. All the funding priorities change. They will have a. They will have their opinion about what they want to be, be procured in terms of what you know, in terms of all of that. Say, so, um, you need to start planning now because if you are wanting to be in the game, I mean, if you've got one combined authority and you're not interested about going elsewhere then that's about your data capture and how you can present that well at tender but if you're looking at um where you want to be in essex and you want to be in london and you want to be in sussex or whatever that looks like i'm just making up counties because it could be anywhere in the country then you need to start planning now about what it is that you need to look at in terms of investing in your it infrastructure in a new world landscape because things will change. And for employability providers out there, you already know this, because if you've got subs with three different primes, you're already working on three different systems. You know that. It's about how you then pull the data out of the different systems to be able to manage well. When it's looking at going through to MD, the, the integration of employability and skills piece, because it's going to be, I, I do believe it's going to have huge impacts over the next year or so. It's about the differing data that you now need to capture. It's not just about contract outcomes anymore. It's about building up those data sets to manage well and manage at a board and executive team level and looking at the cost benefit analysis of what that looks like in terms of future growth. Um, there's huge, huge possibilities in terms of that. Um, there is investment that's attached to it. I would like to point out, by the way, that we were geniuses when it comes to data at the Street not just in the post-16 landscape, thank you very much, but in other things as well. But in this case, that is about looking at what do the data sets need to look like? How do you pull them all together in one place so that everybody in the business that has got um, an interest in what's going on in terms of managing contract and managing profitability and managing sustainability and managing business growth um, can get involved? I would like to... I not forget about the learner never forget and about them. absolutely um and from a data perspective we actually need data around what the learner is doing yes um and where you get the most exciting data is where that learner data the operational learner data 
is in the same data set, we're able to pull it into the same data set as the finance data. Yeah. Because that's Nirvana. Yeah, absolutely. And most providers don't have that at a granular enough, real time enough, accurate enough level. Yeah. And that's going to be the key to surviving and thriving in devolution yeah. is that. If that is something that scares people, they need to kind of get in touch because we know quite a bit about this stuff, don't we? We do. We know, we know what, well, I'm going to say this. We know an awful lot about this stuff. We have good ideas on it. Yeah, I always we, we, I always I think we need to stop now. Thank you so much for watching. Um, and um, if you've got, if, if any of these issues have resonated with you, please do send us a direct message. We would be delighted to talk to you about them further. Thank you very much, Dolly. Please.